Good morning. I am the bearer of good tidings this day. Hydro rates go up 7% residential, up to 23% industrial. In many areas, an additional charge of 63 cents on your bill to help pay for transit losses. Gas, at least in the Greater Vancouver Regional District, goes up three cents a gallon today, also to pay for transit losses. The federal government has decreed that we are going to go groceries metric, metric groceries by January the 1st next year. The recent generous settlements in the hospitals are going to cost you, the taxpayer, $100 million in additional wages this year. The Vancouver police have very snottily turned their noses down at a modest 13% increase. Mind you, they don't know which way to go. They didn't get a big enough vote to strike. Their strike vote has expired, and I predict that they will probably readjust it a little bit, a little bit of internecine warfare, and they'll accept the settlement. Just by the way, commuters to Victoria will be happy to know that the one-way fare goes up four bucks, and charge X rates go today up to 21%. The Social Credit Government of Victoria has a $900 million surplus, and Pat McGear is talking about building a $2 billion channel from Vancouver Island to the mainland. Have a happy April Fool's Day. And what are we going to do this morning? We're going to talk first to the Minister of Universities, Science, Communications, Technology, and Uncle Tom Cobley about his channel after the break. Dr. Patrick McGear, the thinker of the government, brought with him this morning a piece of paper 4.96 meters long, weighing 8.9 grams, grams. <laughs> <laughs> to show you the route potentially of the tunnel to solve the ferry problems between here and Vancouver Island. And as this paper is magically unrolled, we start in Vancouver Island. And we go slowly along, across Sansom Narrows, the shortest link, roll it faster please, shortest link <laughs> between Vancouver and, of all places, Salt Spring Island. It's a bridge across there. Goes over the top of Salt Spring Island, comes down again, and we start an 18-mile tunnel underneath the straits through the Trincomalee Channel, which is three miles wide. Underneath, not on top of, Galliano Island secure in a bed of mud in some places, suspended in other places. We're now in the Georgia Straits, and there goes the tunnel, and you're riding on the back of a flat car in your car, terrified to death, 18 miles, you might do it in 18 minutes, I don't know, we'll find out, through Roberts Bank and up into Delta. End of the 18-mile tunnel, and it comes out somewhere in Delta. Delta. When do we come to the end of this piece of paper? There it is, we're still under the water. There we are in Richmond. And this Patrick McGear could be the greatest transportation achievement of the years of Canada's existence. Is that not correct? It was a hundred years ago that they promised to link over to Vancouver Island as a condition of British Columbia joining Confederation. What more appropriate thing could we do than to have this link to Vancouver Island completed in time for Transpo 86, the 100th anniversary of the first railroad train coming across the continent. And obviously, as old-time politicians, I immediately jump on you and say, I see a glint in your eye. You will repay all the contributions on the Trans-Canada Highway on the island and demand 50% participation from the federal government to finance the tunnel. We should put you in charge of the project, absolutely. The, the important point, of course, for people to know is that it's a project that can be done from an engineering point of view. Let's start at, That's the, the, important let's start at the beginning again, Dr. McGeer. When did this concept arise? I realize it could well be practical. Give me the germination of this idea, the reasons for it. The most important reason for giving consideration right now to going ahead is the alarming increase in ferry traffic. 
and the fact that the old ferries will have to be replaced, a whole new fleet constructed, new terminals prepared, and all of the costs of operating the ferries, which have escalated tremendously in the f past few years, all these things have to be faced unless one develops another method that provides a single solution that will not cause these escalating costs in future years. And that's what a, a, a tunnel or a bridge tunnel would do for us. Let's forget for the moment all the difficulties and pretend, just pretend, there is a decision made to build the tunnel. We'll just pretend that. Describe the tunnel, because when I first chatted with you about the tunnel, I thought, a tunnel, just a D's tunnel all over again, drive through the thing. It's not that kind of tunnel at all, is it? You wouldn't drive through a tunnel this long. You would uh, have a train moving back and forth, and you would drive onto the back of a train, and the train would move through. But that's only one of the solutions. It might turn out that it's far more desirable to build a tunnel that's suspended 100 feet under the water, or even a bridge that goes on top of the water and converts into a tunnel that goes 100 uh, feet below the surface over where the shipping, uh, or under where the shipping lanes go. Would it be a one-way tunnel or a two-way tunnel? Oh, I think it would be, if you were going to build a bridge tunnel, you would have a two-way uh, uh, lane that would carry trains, would carry trucks, would carry cars. You could drive yourself over that kind of a structure that would um, at the same time make provision for electricity and for gas so that you have a complete transportation and energy corridor. Yeah, but the point that I'm making is, uh, do, do you envisage everything traveling on electric trains so that there would be no fumes in the tunnel? If you had a tunnel, that is what you would do. You wouldn't expect people to drive through an 18-mile tunnel. But obviously, in my view, you would have to move cars. Because if you didn't move cars, we'd need to continue to build ferries so that you can move the cars on the ferries. So that uh, if it were a tunnel, then you would have a train and the cars would go on to the backs of the train. And you'd and sit in your car on the back of the train. Sure. Terrified all the way. Well, I Moving would at high speed. You know, I would think you'd uh, just relax and uh, listen to music and enjoy the 15 or 20 minute trip uh, uh, to the other side. Now, if it's going to be a bridge, a floating bridge that dips down underneath the water for the shipping lanes, then that's something that you would drive yourself on the surface and enjoy the gorgeous weather as we're enjoying in Vancouver now, today. Now, is there anywhere in the world yet where they have built a practical and finished a tunnel of this length or this comparable size underneath a sea anywhere? Yes, the Straits of Tsugaru in Japan, between the northern island of Hokkaido and the main island of Honshu, has a tunnel now being built which will be considerably longer than the proposed tunnel between Vancouver Island and the mainland. So that's now underway. It will be completed, I believe, in two years' time. And that will be the longest underwater tunnel in the world. And is that a drive tunnel? You drive through it? No, there'll be trains going through that. Trains going through it. They only cost yeah. a billion four or something, or will be costing well, a billion four. We have invited the Japanese out here to review their particular project and to take a look at ours. They haven't arrived yet, but I'm hoping they will come in the very near future. We have had overseas consultants from Britain who have outlined a number of options to us. The most significant advances in tunnels and structures under the water have been in the fields of uh, transporting oil and gas, where people have had to uh, uh, build structures for hundreds of miles mm -hmm. under the sea. So there have been tremendous advances in the engineering skills that would be necessary <laughs> to build uh, a tunnel across to Vancouver Island, and it's this advance mm. that will make it so practical for us to consider at this time going You can't ahead. lay this on the bed of the straits because there's a thousand feet of mud or more. Is that right? Well, oh, that's, uh, that's not known. Um, I would think you probably could. Again, there are methods of digging trenches. What you do is you come with a high-speed uh, jet of water, and you just uh, hose out a trench. You lay your tunnel on that, and then and then uh, backfill over the top of the uh, over the top of the tunnel. That's how you would do it if you were to uh, lay a tunnel along the. All bottom. right. Do you want to see this tunnel built? 
Do I want to see yes. it built? I'm in favor of it. Jeff. Is it an econ economic proposition for British Columbia? I believe it will prove to be. At this point, there is speculation as to whether it's economically attractive or futuristic. You <laughs> it's, want econ it's economically attractive if you know you can pay it off in a brief period of time. It's futuristic if you're not sure. But uh, certainly it is not economically irresponsible. The orders of magnitude ballpark figures we've been given suggest that it would probably be economically attractive. By 1986? Yes. Webster and Dr. Patty McGeer, Minister of Inventions for the Social Credit Government after the break. <laughs> One final question in the tunnel. Have, <laughs> have you checked with Dr. Gordon Shrum to see if he'll be available to build it? <laughs> <laughs> Because he's the man who pulls you out of all your messes. Well, he? he's somebody who spent his first 65 years in physics, and he said, I always should have been an engineer. So it's never too late even for you, Jack. And Dr. Shum may well have to pull you out of it. However, that's beside the point. Give me the economic facts about the ferries, and then I have a question to ask you about the inefficient operation of the ferries right now, which might well, what's the word? Not vegetate, vitiate. What's the word I'm looking for? Vitiate, yeah, the, 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 the uh, viability of the ferries in, in the future. Uh, which may well avoid the need for it in such a hurry. Tell me the sad facts about the ferries in simple, clearly understandable terms. I know the food's not much good, and I know that people are unhappy with much of the service, but tell me about the money. Uh, well, the costs of building a ferry, of buying the fuel, and of operating ferries are just going out of sight, uh, quite apart from questions about reliability, because uh, every year during the rush, uh, uh, rush season we seem to be threatened with the strike. When the ferry fleet was first conceived by the W.A.C. Bennett government, right. they decided that they would really gamble. If they were going to have a failure, they'd have a big one. So they said, okay, we'll build two 108-car ferries, if you can believe it. Now, 15 years later, we can't keep up with the traffic building jumbo ferries, putting in new terminals, devising systems for loading uh, at two levels at once, and all the things that people are familiar with. There are people who live on Vancouver Island who say that they're virtual prisoners during the summertime because it's six to eight hours to get off the island and, the, and unreliable about getting back. So here they are, really locked in by their own prosperity. <coughs> Tourists are preventing them from using the ferry system that's there to provide them with access to the, to the mainland. So here we've got a system which is expensive, uh, which is undependable when you really need it, and which is causing frustration both for the government and for the public. Now, how can you get around all of that? Well, you build a fixed link. So okay, that you don't people have to are just as liable to strike your fixed link as any other link. Well, now, wouldn't, you wouldn't avoid strikes merely because you had a fixed link. Oh, if you, have a, uh, if you have a bridge tunnel, it would be just like the second narrowest bridge or the first narrowest bridge. You mean bridge. drive across it? Sure. And, now, and uh, by the way, uh, obviously it would be a toll structure, but nevertheless, uh, systems have now been uh, organized for taking tolls automatically so that the thing would just... Uh, uh, Facts of life. You need $400 million for new terminals. About. Have you, are you this year going Iona to Gabriola on the short run, with the two, preparing for that with the two new ferries that are going to be delivered next year? No. Iona to Gabriola is a must, isn't it? If you don't build a fixed link, it is. Even but without a fixed link, no, surely? No. If you, if you uh, put in a fixed link, uh, you don't need to go Iona to Gabriola at all. Subsidies in the next 10 years, got into Gallagher, minimum of $750 million. I, I would think more than that. I would think more than that. Uh, new ships to replace worn out, broken down, tired out old ships, at least $200 million yes. within the next five or six years. Yes. Uh, and you've got to put a BC Hydro line across the channel. $800 million. $800 million. Yeah. That would go in the tunnel. Well, uh, we can't get the tunnel, unfortunately, finished in time for that particular line. We're going to spend that anyway. I think well, that's might going as well anyway. Take yeah. that out. Uh, but there'll be more will have to be sent across to the island. You see, this is only going to do us for a few years. Natural gas get, line, natural gas line too. Yep, 200 million. 200 million for the natural gas line. Yeah. 
So we've got total expenses coming down the pike, 4, 11, 13, put that in 21, 23, 2.35 billion. Yeah. Right Plus now. all of the operating costs. You see, you can't, uh, yeah. you can't ignore the fact that, uh, I've forgotten what the revenues of the ferries are, 50 or 60 million. Uh, and that's per year. So if you go eight years, uh, where you're looking at another four to five hundred million dollars there, that people are paying one way or another to support this system. So that the uh, transportation between Vancouver Island and the mainland is, <laughs> as you can see, an extremely costly proposition. Regardless. Now, yeah, and uh, we're, uh, the, the, the coast uh, is this one delta and in the Fraser River and huge mountains all the way up and down. Mm -hmm. No room, really. Uh, Vancouver Island, however, has got lots of room on it. And this is why so much traffic goes across to Vancouver Island and why, proportional to the population, there's this tremendous movement back and forth. And therefore, uh, uh, I don't think it's being all that futuristic to say, build a fixed link now. I think it should have been done before this. You know what Gallagher should do in the meantime? I was talking to a, a big shot businessman the other day, and he says, you do not expend capital for new equipment until you have maximized your present use. He said, the business answer to run the BC ferries efficiently is to run them 24 hours a day, have a computer reservation system, and people must take the reservation they can get closest to the time. And he said that would increase the capacity of the ferries over the next five years 100%. But inconvenience the public. Yeah, but how much money can BC carry on its own back, even with federal help, to give it the optimum thing that it, that it wants? I mean, there's a limit to public expenditure, is there not? Yes. Now, may I come back, however, to one of the advantages of having a fixed link. During the peak season, you'll carry three times as many passengers per day as you do during the off-season. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Balf, who's been a great backer of the tunnel, has calculated that it would take 100 trips a day of the Marguerite six years from now to handle the peak daily loads. You build a ferry fleet that can manage a peak load and then much of the rest of the time it has to remain empty well, because see. there aren't people to use it. So what you're doing then, despite what Mr. Gallagher says about efficiency, you're building a system that will carry reasonably a load that would come along in a beautiful July day in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Now when you put a fixed link in, it is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It can handle huge traffic peaks. It can provide the freight. And therefore, you don't have this disparity of, uh, of, of tremendous operating costs for plant that must lie idle much of the time. Tell you what we'll do. We're going to take a break. Do you mind if I get Sam, the tunnel man, or Sam, the ferry man on the phone, to fill yeah. us in with some of his horrendous yes. fears? Yes. And then we'll go straight to the phones to see how people react to the tunnel idea because, you know, it's a frightening thing in some ways. Yes, it will definitely change lifestyle and that's a concern. Turn Victoria into a suburb of Vancouver. I see the wrong thing. <laughs> I don't think that would ever happen. Sam Ball from the phone. Could you get him for me, Linda? McGeer and you, the channel, $2 billion after the break. Sammy there. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. How are you? This is Sam the Tunnel Man. He used to be uh, the ferry minister in uh, the Social Credit Government. Give us your scenario of horrors for ferry travelers, please, Sam. Well, Jack, uh, it's a simple matter of arithmetic. Last year, uh, the ferry system carried, just on the Nanaimo and Victoria runs, uh, an average of about 20,000 people a day. That's 365 days into the annual, divided into the annual volume. Now, at the present rate of growth, we're looking at something uh, by the end of this decade between 40 and 50,000 
people a day. That goes from 8 million to 16 million a year. That's, that's right, or, or more, because the, the rate of growth in traffic is accelerating. Contrary to what the ferry corporation thought perhaps uh, two years ago, where they were predicting that it would uh, slow, uh, in fact, the growth is accelerating. So we're looking at an average volume uh, daily, 365 days a year, 40 to 50,000 people a day. Now, of course, we know, as, as Dr. McGeer has been saying, that much of that traffic is bunched around the holiday season. And in fact, the, uh, the holiday traffic is frequently three times what your daily average would be through the year. So we're talking about moving 150,000 people a day. How long will the waits be a couple of years down the road after we get the two new ferries, even if we put in Iona and Gabriola? Well, if we put everything in place, if we spend $400 million for, for Iona Gabriola, and then if we add on to that the highway costs of a highway bypass around the Nanaimo, if we figure out how you're going to fight this out with the, the federal government for the use of the Art Lang Bridge and uh, Sea Island, uh, if you go ahead and expand the and replace the ferry fleet for another $200 million, spend your $750 million in subsidies to operate the ferry fleet, it's still going to be uh, completely paralyzed by the volume of traffic at the present growth rate by the end of the decade. And in fact, you won't get all of these things done, particularly the terminals, until probably at least five years down the road. So we're building a system uh, which... Uh, uh, has a dubious future. Agree, Pat? Absolutely. All right, question to Pat McGeer. Bolf's other idea is to put on high-speed jet foils to move people only, which would be a lot cheaper than a tunnel. Is that not right? Well, that's right, Jack, but only as an interim measure. I mean, all we can do is see, after 1982 or 83, we have used our existing terminals to absolute capacity. In other words, the solution doesn't lie in building more boats because they can't be accommodated in the terminals. If we order new terminals today, for example, Iona Gabriola, they're, as I said, at least five years off. So we're going to start to have a crunch in about 1983. Now, I've said we've got to do something of a remedial nature, but it doesn't make sense to go and spend half a billion dollars on new terminals that are going to have a practical life of about five years. Therefore, the tunnel's the only answer. So I've said start building a fixed link now. Uh, if you have a, a period of hiatus in there where the ferry system is a capacity. Uh, you don't want to build uh, piles of new terminals and boats and so on just to, to get you tied you over till the tunnel or bridge mm -hmm. tunnel is completed. Then use some fast uh, passenger only type of equipment uh, and it'll work for two or three years. Okay, any quibble with Sam, Pat? No, I, I would say though that for Victoria itself, the greatest weakness is the lack of an adequate airport close to the city. Victoria badly needs a Stoll Airport. The Patricia Bay Airport is inadequate, and it's a ridiculously long distance away from the city of Victoria. Indeed, the only decent airport on the whole of Vancouver Island is the one at the Air Force Base at Comox. So the island is uh, badly served by air. Um, it's not too well served by water. And these other novel systems, like jet foils and hovercraft and so on, uh, have their own problems. Something has to be done. I thoroughly agree with Sam that we're just not keeping up with the demand. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Sam. Much obliged. Let's take some phone calls. I don't know how people are going to react no. to channels. Nor do I. You say it could be finished by 1986? If we really turn the heat on, yes. And, but, if, you know what would happen. You'd go to Ottawa. Otto would say, no, it would be like the breakwater in the East Coast be like harnessing the Bay of Fundy tides. It would go on for a thousand years, wouldn't it? Well, uh, my attitude towards Ottawa, and many would disagree with this, is that if you want to do things in British Columbia, you do it. Uh, we're always going to move faster than the East. We're always going to have more initiative. This is the area that is growing. It's becoming the economic power for Canada. And therefore, if we judge our progress yeah. according to the pace of Ottawa, we're going to be held back. And my attitude is that we go ahead and do these things. And scream for and the money after. Yes, we ask for their, for their participation. We never have to ask for more than what they're going to give the province of Quebec or the other eastern provinces. But that provinces. would build a tunnel tomorrow if they gave us what they gave the province of yeah, Quebec. You're always into a different discussion with Ottawa if you're from the eastern Public Quebec. reaction, public reaction. Go ahead to McGeer on the tunnel. Or a floating bridge or tunnel. That's it. Or a combination of floating bridge and tunnel. 
Go ahead, please. Hey, Jack. Yes, yes. I would like to ask Mr. McGeer how many lanes he's going to have in this tunnel. Well, if you're building a floating bridge and a tunnel, you would probably have four lanes or more. The reason being, in order to get stability in your structure, you have to build it fairly wide. If you're going to build uh, a tunnel that goes right underneath everything, you would probably restrict the number of lanes and have uh, uh, passing lanes for trains so that you could run uh, uh, two at once. I think it depends a little on the type of... Do you like it or do you not? Jack, now let me let me ask him another question. Yeah. Uh, has he ever been across the Lionsgate Bridge on a busy morning, and how long you have to wait? How long would you have to wait to get through that tunnel on a busy day or a holiday weekend? I think we'd have to sit down with pencils and figure out how many cars you're going to. You can uh, do 1,500 or uh, uh, cars per lane per hour, uh, and that means that you would be able to handle 3,000 cars per hour. Uh, in 12 hours, you'd be able to handle 36,000 cars. Uh, if you had uh, two cars, uh, two, two or three people per car, you're looking between uh, 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. or 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Of yeah. uh, a lot of people would still use the fatties because of I was, fear. I listened this morning to a program, Jack, and it was the uh, head of the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce in Victoria, and he's dead against the tunnel. He says the people in Victoria do not want Vancouverites commuting back and forth from Victoria. Oh, that's a racist remark. <laughs> I resent it very much. I could commute every day to Salt Spring. Because I'll still be working in 1990. No, I don't think that would really prove to be practical. No, no. But uh, there is a feeling, I guess, in, in, in Victoria that everybody who is in Vancouver would love to move over there. Uh, I'm not sure that's the truth. No, I'm quite sure it's not. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Yes, keep it brief this morning. I want to get as many viewpoints as I can as quickly as possible. Very good. I'd like to ask Pat what his opinion is of the businessman's suggestion that greater utilization is made of the ferry service. Now, I'd like to draw a parallel. That is, the airlines who use their equipment to the full. And uh, that's the only way they can keep ahead of the cash flow and profits and so forth. It makes good sense to me. And before we go into some fantastic scheme that's going to cost us a tremendous taxation burden, and not quite aware of what the practical impact is, uh, should we not try, first of all, to utilize these ferries 24 hours a day, irrespective of the inconvenience to the public? I don't, think, I don't think you should, as a politician, worry about that too much. Oh, People no. want to get over and on time, and if they have a computerized reservation and leave at 2 in the morning, so what? Sure. Uh, well, uh, I see no objection to that. I'm merely pointing out that if everybody wants to go, for the July 1st weekend, uh, you try and build some reasonable capacity to handle that demand. It's the same thing uh, in trying to get a reservation on the airlines uh, to go to the Hawaiian Islands at Christmas time. And you they can't get them half the time. That's right. And so you cancel your trip. Now, I'm with you, caller. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. McGeer. Uh, you're looking ahead on McGeer, and that's good. We need that. I didn't understand what he said. No, he I was didn't. speaking in Glasgow, Jack. What did he You've say? What did he say? Translate. Mr. McGrath looks ahead for 100 years, and that's good. We need that. You look ahead for 100 years. We need that. He's complimenting you, and that's Thank not you. a Glasgow accent. You know that in Holland, you see on new Glasgow. <laughs> they build tunnels on the Mars. That will work. Easy. Of course they do. Go ahead. Okay. Congratulations to Dr. McGee. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I think this is a tremendous idea. I was wondering how many jobs it would create. Oh, millions. About 4,000 for uh, the time of the construction. Most of the materials would come from British Columbia. It would be strictly a local job. Thank you, sir. Dr. McGee and Webster and the tunnel, tunnel, floating bridge, whatever, after the break. Are you there, Sam? Yes, Jack. Sam, I'm sorry I cut you off. Make your final point, though. Sure. Go on. Okay. The point... Uh, That's right. You're on the air, Sam. The point, the point here is that uh, if you have uh, 150,000 people going across on a peak day or an average of 50,000 people a day through the year, you're going to have revenue in the order of uh, $270 million a year. And you add on to that the freight that is carried to Vancouver Island uh, currently, mainly by the CPR. Uh, the gentleman on the telephone mentioned 
tax dollars. I see this uh, project as self-sustaining. What kind of tolls are you thinking about? I'm using the present figures of $15 for two people in a car uh, on the ferries, and I'm looking at the population that's going to be making that crossing in 10 years, and I'm adding to that the value of the toll for freight, which is currently carried primarily uh, in the CPR, which, as you know, is on strike. A very good point, Sam, and thanks very much. It'll pay for itself in 15 years, Jack. Thank you. Any comment? No, I think this is what makes it economically attractive, you see, because looking down the road, people would have a free crossing between here and Vancouver Island. That's something to consider, because as long as you're running boats, the costs, you know, are going to escalate higher and higher. Eventually, and higher. you pay for your tunnel. That's right, and it's free, just like we've paid for the bridges. Go ahead, please. Hi, um, uh, I think that tunnel would be a good idea. Good idea, thank you. Go ahead, please. Uh, how many lanes and how many directions is, are we talking about? Yeah, you confused me on that, too. It depends on the solution. If you dig a tunnel, you would have most of it simply one lane with a crossover in the middle so that you could run two one trains. One direction, how many times per hour? How long are we going to wait at a terminal to get on the train? Well, uh, again, it depends on the length of the train, but I'm just saying that's one possibility. The one that offers the most versatility, in my view, is the one where you have a floating bridge and then you have a tunnel that dips down under the shipping lanes. And if you did something like this, Ported. you could have uh, two lanes of traffic uh, on either way. side, each way, plus uh, um, room for rail. So that that would offer you the, 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 the most lanes and the most versatility. Like room for rail. So you're talking about cars on wheels then? Yeah, that's right. Drive yourself. For that, uh, for that solution, you would drive yourself. But you would also have a rail train through there. Oh, yeah, sure. Electric, of course. Yes. Or oh, could you ventilate such a thing? Um, well, it's impractical to ventilate a tunnel that's very deep, that's 30 miles long, to the extent that would be required for internal combustion engines mm -hmm. to operate. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, that becomes a bad solution to run cars through a, 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 a long distance a deep underground. Tunnel, yeah. yeah, that's right. And that's one of the Whether disadvantages the, uh, of the, the tunnel. the ferries from, from England to France and back run all night, do they? Yes, oh, I think, yes, yeah, of course they do. Yeah. The midnight sailings to, from Dover. I tell you this if you go on that ferry between Folkestone and Dover across the channel, any of them, you become very, very proud of the BC ferry service. The costs are about uh, a third to a quarter as much, and the service is immensely better. That's an extremely poor service across the channel. It's, it's really a disgrace. And if you go through the tunnels in the Swiss Alps, they horrify you. Yes, it is fearsome to drive for any distance in a tunnel. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Mr. McGeer, do you think it's all possible that the federal government provide funds for a project of this size? And if so, by what percent is possible? I just hesitate to predict anything about the federal government. I do not think we should make our decision to go ahead or not to go ahead on the basis of what the federal government does or does not decide to do. I think in the West, if we ever get ourselves into that type of thinking, we'll just be held back. We've got to make our own decisions and act. Ask the federal government to help and participate, yes, but not be governed by, by, by them because they'll always be the slow step. Uh, from Seattle, it may be a tourist. I hope it's not the guy that phoned me yesterday. Go ahead, please. Oh, yes. Uh, we're, I heard, of, what kind of damage can this thing stand up to? Because we're building one here in Washington State across the Hood Canal where a bridge fell in about last year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, because of the log, which said the floating log is supposed to stand up for years. Now, if another storm happened in this, and the people were going across the tunnel during this storm and this thing broke in, Hundreds of people could. Ah, oh, you've been a nervous Nelly for nothing. If we build it up here, it won't blow away, will it? Yeah, yeah you could. It's buried underground, or isn't it? Or partly suspended, or partly floating. We don't yeah. quite know yet. We're still really dreaming, aren't yeah. we? No, we're not dreaming. Uh, th th this is an entirely new uh, era of technology from the time the Hood Canal Bridge was built. I mean, one could make the same argument about the Tacoma Bridge that collapsed, uh, that we shouldn't build any more bridges because uh, there might be a car on it when the bridge collapsed. Uh, they had a large bridge fall down uh, uh, in Vienna uh, across the Danube River uh, a year ago. That bridge had been there for, I think, 100 years. Now, the point about it is that engineering does improve, mm -hmm. and we're looking at a completely different technology than the time when that Hood Canal Bridge, and there's just no point in making that analogy. Seashell Peninsula, go ahead, please. 
Yes, Jack, uh, Mr. McGeer, I am uh, fully in approval of this uh, idea of the tunnel to Vancouver Island. However, uh, this is only part of the problem. Uh, we people on the, on the Sunshine Coast, we're faced with these problems every day. And it seems They've got six-hour lineups now. Well, uh, I'll tell you the answer to that, and I've been seeing it for t 20 years. Uh, you finish the 15 miles or so of road between Port Mellon and Squamish. Problem over. Um, and in my view, that's something which should be done as a priority. Now, that doesn't emancipate the people who live on the other side of, the, of, of, of Jervis Inlet. They're still a little bit isolated at Powell River, and uh, therefore, for a time, they're going to have to face that ferry ride across you mean to the say, mouth of Jervis Inlet. You mean to say that there's just a 15-mile link and you can save the souls of all the people on the Sea Shell Peninsula? Sure. Squamish to Port Mellon. That's right. Just round the bay there. That's right. Yikes. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough terrain, and you've got to bridge the Squamish River, but nevertheless, it's <laughs> quite possible to do it. And, it, and uh, I believe, as a matter of priority, that should be undertaken. Yes, caller. It's amazing, you know, Jack. The, the, the government has talked for years about making the ferry system people-oriented rather than vehicle-oriented. Now, if you go down to the ferry, I don't care whether I line up at Cloverdale to get on a ferry if I'm driving a vehicle, but when I'm a foot passenger, my God, I, the, the whole thing is ass about elbow. You have to you have to park your car right in front of the ferry, and if you're a walk-on passenger, you're half a mile away. Now, I don't care whether you get on at Langdale, or whether you get on at Horseshoe Bay, or whether you get on at Vancouver, on yeah, Vancouver That's Island. a ferry administration point, though, isn't it? That's just a bad administration by the ferry people. The, the whole thing is incredible, you know, if, if, if I go across for freight onto Van, on, into Vancouver, I have two or three parcels or something like this, I've got to pack them all the way down a ramp for maybe a thousand feet or so. Fair, I've got your problem, but I don't want to listen to it. You know, you go on forever yeah, about but, that. but you can't build huge parking lots at the ferry terminal. Uh, th that's unreasonable. If you take the bus, of course, you can start from a terminal downtown and go all the way across to a terminal on the other side. It's just impractical I'll to think in terms we'll of... It's bad enough trying to build uh, waiting areas for those that are actually going to take the ferry. There just isn't room at a ferry terminal. Let's have a little bit of fun before you go. Yeah. Let's just do a poll. For or against the tunnel to Vancouver Island. How e about that? Excellent. Good fun. Yes. Keep account too. All right. Know. Here we go. No, no, after the break. Now, all I want, please, now do as you're told this morning. It's April Fool's Day, but still do as you're told. All I want is for or against a $2 billion tunnel to Vancouver Island. It's nothing about the ferries. It's not about Gallagher. It's not even about social credit, because they certainly won't be in power in 1986 when Transpo is here. <laughs> it's for or against the tunnel after the break. I predict that all the callers will come on quickly and say for or against the tunnel proposition to Vancouver Island. After all, it is really a bit of a dream in most of our minds, but it's April Fool's Day and we're entitled to dream. <laughs> for or against? Yes, I'm against it. Thank you, sir. For or against? For the tunnel. Thank you. For or against? For or against? For or against? Linda, what's happening? We'll start again. Will we? We've <laughs> yeah. got one for and, <laughs> and one against. against. Okay. Are you for or against? I'm against. Thank you. Okay. Are you for or against? For. Thank you. Are you for or against? For. Thank you. Are you for or against? For. Thank you. Are you for or against? For if it's safe. For if it's safe. <laughs> That's five. Are you for or against? Where are you? In the, where are you? Yes. Are you for or against for. it? Good man. Fought or against? Without the earthquake, I'm for it. No earthquakes and you fought it. Fought or against? Yes, no earthquakes and I'm for it too. Thank you very much. So we've got to count now just to double check you on my computer. Eight to two. Eight to two. Well, normally we'll only count it when we reach ten components of ten, right? All right. Fought or against? Four. Thank you. Fought or against? Four. Thank you. Fought or against? <laughs> No, no, what, what did she say? What did she say? What did she say? I thought it was no, but I'm not dead sure. No, Just forget the, it. Are you for or against? I'm for. Thank you. Are you for or against? Oh, um, I'm for it, but I... Thank you. Quite... That's all I want from you. <laughs> are, are, are you for or against? Where are you? That's you. 
You're daft this morning. Are you for or against? Against. Thank you very much. That's three. Are you for or against? Linda, it's the full moon again. Are you for or against? Where are you? I'll leave her for a moment. How about you? Against. Against. Thank you. That's four. Are you for or against? Hello. Four. Oh, you're for. Thank you very much. And you? Definitely for it. Thank you. And you? Come on. <laughs> are you there? You're not there. Nobody there. Bridge. How about you? What are you for? I'm for with a bridge. You're for, oh. for well, you're for. You can't yeah. equivocate on this broad question. Are you? Uh, oh, away we go. Okay. I'll accept the call. Are you for or against? Against. Thank you very much. Are you for or against? <laughs> Wrong line. Are you for or against? For. Thank you very much. Are you for or against? Come on. Are you there? Not there. Funny. April Fool's Day. Maybe they pulled tricks <laughs> on me this morning. Are you for or against? Against. Thank you. How about you? Eight. How about you? Four. Four. Uh, four. What's your count? Fifteen to six? Uh, seventeen to six. Uh, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve. That's right. Seventeen to six. Are you for or against? Four. Four. Eighteen. Are you for or against? Four. Nineteen. Are you for or against? I'm for John Wester for President of the United States. So am I. Thank you very much. <laughs> April Fool's Day. Are you, are you for or against? For. Good. 20. Thank you. Are you for or against? Do it. It won't get cheaper. Do it. It won't get cheaper. 21. How about you? Four. Thank you. 22. And you? Come on. Go against. You're against. Yes. You'll be next. You are next. Are you for or against? That's you. Come on. You Can't hear her. Are you for or against? Somebody's playing silly fools with the television volume. It's spring break. These little stinkers are on the phone. <laughs> Get your kids away from the phone. Don't beat them. <laughs> Not too much. Are you for or against? I'm for it all the way. Thank you. That's the answer, Pat. You should yeah. never do... Well, your teachers are on holiday again for the spring <laughs> break. Remember, you gave them all these conditions and whatnot. It's all your fault. Are you, are you for or against? That's these kids. Are you there? Remind me to do no more polls this week. Are you there? Are you there? I'm against. Thank you very much, sir. Eight. Are you there? Yes, I'm against it. Thank you very much. And you? Are you there on the long distance? Four. Thank you very much. Okay. 24. We'll keep going a little yeah. bit. Your count now, Pat. Uh, 24 to 9. 24 to 9. Well, we'll have to keep going until 50 calls yeah. if we can get these kids off the phone. Little stinkers. <laughs> Are you for or against? Four. Thank you. 25. How about you? Yes, I'm for it. 26. <coughs> How about you? <coughs> How about you? With a motorist accident protection solution, I'm for. 27, you're for it. You're next. Are you for or against? Come on. I'm, I'm for. Thank you. No, uh, I want to ask, oh well. Are you for or against it? No, how many miles it was. 18 miles, are you for or against it? Oh. <laughs> Undecided. Come on. <laughs> you're not buying it, you're just giving me an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Fifteen miles would be an awful long time to be in a dark car. <laughs> Especially with some people I know. Bridge. No, no, no. She's uh, against it, Pat. Uh, against. Okay. Ten. Fair. We, um, keep, we must keep going. Uh, Are you for or against it? How about you? I'm for it, sir. Thank you very much, ma'am. How about you? I'm for. Good. How about you? For it. Good. Thank you. How about you? For. Thank you. And you? I'm for it. Thank you. And you? Four. Thank you. And you? Come on. Hello? Ma'am? Are you for it or against it? I'm four. 35 to 10. We've only 35 five to, to go. 10. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. And you? For it. Thank you. 36. And you? For it. 37. And you? And you? And you? For it. 38. And you? 
Come on. You? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm for it. The sooner the better. Yeah. Thank you. And you? Where are you? Here. Are you for it or against it? For it, sir. Thank you. 40 to 10. Too much of a sweat this morning. 40 to 10. I'd right. forgotten the little That's stinkers that were on spring break. <laughs> That's not bad, 40 to 10, is it? Yeah. Mind you, we all go for pie in the sky. That's why we elect governments, I suppose. I don't think this one's pie in the sky. Neither do I. Where do we stand? Okay, Patrick, uh, we'll skip the problems in universities. We'll skip the problems in mainstreaming, which you left this poor fellow Smith to clean up. Uh, what else will we skip? Eh? Well, I tell you what, Jack. Get all the tough questions together and, and, come and, and invite me back. Could you take away your 15 feet, 4.89 meters of paper? Quite seriously, though, it's a viable proposition. You have not got cabinet approval on it yet. You've got no engineering studies yet. That's right. You've merely had Freeman and Fox here from London who have given you uh, an offhand opinion. It's better than offhand, Jack. These are the foremost engineering people in this field in the world. And before and you uh, go, let me just recap it. If it were this particular one, it would either be a bridge, a road from Duncan to Sansom Narrows, a bridge across Sansom Narrows, a, a structure over Salt Spring, underneath 18 miles somewhere to Delta, right? Mm -hmm. And it would either be floating partly and partly sunk through the ship channel, which would likely be four lane plus rail, or if it was a deep tunnel all the way through, it would be totally rail plus, say, gas and hydro channels if more were needed at that particular time. I think another possibility, just a small variation, would be to start off uh, somewhere near the airport and go uh, to Gabriola Island, where there's a very, very narrow bridge that gets you across to the area just south of Nanaimo. That's another possibility. Same distance? Yeah, about the same distance. A little, little longer. A little longer. Uh, but uh, you're not into quite as many um, uh, delicacies uh, uh, along the bottom. It's a, it's a little better bottom there to fix anchors. Mm. Nothing else up your sleeve today? Science, technology at all? Next week, Jack, we'll have an interesting announcement. Major new announcements. My thanks to Pat McGee. Uh, for some American next, I have to be nice to him after the break. Brian has the latest developments on the story of Augusta Zanetti and the problem he faced, perhaps to move his whole operation to the United States. Brian reported on it the other day. Brian? Okay, Jack, on that update about uh, Zanetti passed a story that was broadcast on Thursday, uh, we have uh, some happy news, but with some reservation. Two of the three elements that were contributing to the Kamloops past demands problems have now been worked out, at least at present, on a temporary basis. A bit of a recap, Augusto Zanetti is a man who close to four years ago decided to set up a pasta manufacturing plant in Kamloops, employed 30 people doing it, and spent up to $4 million during that time promoting a line of pasta products, spaghetti, lasagna, etc. His problems were the big pasta companies from the east who were successful in exerting enough market pressure to keep him off the shelves in BC. His second problem, which uh, was the result of the first, developed when he turned to the lucrative US market where he now sells about 70% of his goods. He found that Durham flour, the essential item needed for pasta manufacturing, cost about 30% less there. So he tried repeatedly and failed to get his product uh, through the wheat board from the United States, either on an import basis or at least a preferred price in Canada for that product. Then his third problem developed. He was losing about $20,000 a month because of the first two problems. So to make a long story short, we'll say that the first problem has started to correct itself. Zetti, Zanetti is now getting orders from the supermarkets, namely uh, Safeway, and so uh, they're starting to buy his product. Um, and for a time being anyway, the bank has temporarily postponed calling his loan. So he's going to be allowed to continue at least uh, for at least another couple of weeks. And his plans to shut down yesterday, move his plant to the states, uh, have at least temporarily been postponed. But there's another problem. The wheat board. And you explained it to me very lucidly last time around, that unless he could get the price, he could get Durham flour of his particular type, 
at the price that it's being sold for in the United States, he was at a great competitive disadvantage. 30% less. Okay, the wheat board equivocated for a while, and now you have news from the wheat board which will make people's hair stand on end. Okay, first of all, they've said, submit us a competitive bid. Of American Durham wheat. Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll listen to you. But secondly. But now they've told him, and this isn't, this isn't an April Fool's joke, you can get the product from the United States if it's in, say, 20-pound bags. 20 right? kilo bags. 20 pound. Tw oh, of course, American yeah. bags, 20 pound bags. So it could be sold on supermarket shelves. But. French and English labeling. He's now got to find the manufacturer of Durham pasta flour in the United States who's prepared to put it in 20 kilo or 20 pound bags and have the bilingual labeling, because if it doesn't have the bilingual labeling, even if it's not for retail sale, but only for use in his plant, if it doesn't have the bilingual labeling, it can't get across the border. Right, and he can buy it in any amount at the price he can get it for it, if it contains those uh, restrictions. He's now got to lean on some American fac mm -hmm. factory to put it in market shelf sizes, mm -hmm. put it bilingual, he'll bring it over, nobody will ever see it, he'll go into his plant in Kamloops and be turned into the hopper. Yeah, and he can read it in French, which he doesn't understand anyway. It's crazy, though. But I mean, if it was going on the shelf, we've got an official languages act, and therefore on the shelf you've got to have both languages. But it's not good on the shelf. And of course we know that's not economical anyway because nobody would produce it just for Zanetti. But the good news for Zanetti and his 30 employees, and one, he's now getting shelf space and orders from the big chains. Mm -hmm. his, his bank and Secondly, is his bank has backed off for a little while. The jobs are safe for a little while. Now he's just got to solve the bilingual labeling of the bags, bring it in at still a 30% advantage to him and the plant will stay in Canada. Yeah, and at the same time he's submitting what he thinks is a competitive bid and hopefully the wheat board will grab, uh, grab that as an alternative to the uh, bilingual bags. Who is the minister involved in Ottawa? Senator Hazen Argue. Well, the old CCF. Man he's from Saskatchewan. You see, the wheat board man. Yeah. We should try it on for size with Hazen Argue. Because I'm quite sure that... I've called him, he hasn't returned it. Hasn't phoned you back? Yeah. Next installment in the Zanetti Pasta business crisis will be reported as it occurs in French and English by Brian Coxford. Now I'm going to interview a, a lecturer on the Soviet Union from the United States. Probably thinks we should all swamp the Olympics and love what's happened in Afghanistan. After the break. William Mandel is a lecturer on Soviet affairs. He wrote a book about Soviet women. Just the other day, I introduced uh, an exiled journalist, a journalist who was deported called Ilya Garo. I was on the air with him. Were you? Yeah. Very impressive man. Not to me. Was telling me the truth all the way. Take it away. Eh? Uh, you're obviously going to give me the party line. First of all... That's nonsense, sir. In 1962 in the Kremlin, I represented the entire non-communist peace movement of the world opposing Mr. Khrushchev. Khrushchev got up and said he's going to resume bomb testing. And I was asked by the Canadian, by the British as Bertrand Russell's people, uh, by the Scandinavians, to be their spokesperson. And I got up and said, in the Kremlin, mm -hmm. if you resume bomb testing, we're going to have to resume bomb testing because no explanation to the people of the West that your bombs are better than ours is going to work. So please, let's forget the party lines. Sir. Okay, let me give you give me your views on the Olympics, then. Let's test you on a few party lines. Okay, fine. I think that Mr. Carter has isolated the United States as never in the 200 years of our history. He's got China, Malaysia, and Kenya. And Chile. A, and Chile. Of and a possibly Britain. Uh, he has Mrs. Thatcher. Let's, right. not, let's not confuse the two. Mm -hmm. Uh, the British Olympic Committee insists that it's going to Moscow. They're just another bunch of selfish athletes, too, same as the Canadians on the main, it would seem. I would say that there are people who have some common sense against a sanctimonious hypocrite in the White House, my president, who praised the, the Shah of Iran for the wonderful things he was doing for that country two years ago, when the president knew perfectly well that Savak had killed by torture about 100,000 people. In short, his morality does not depend upon his reborn Christianity. It depends upon his politics in a given situation. Are you so simple-minded that you expect the leaders of world powers to tell you the truth about no. their allies in international no, affairs? No, I do not. All I'm saying do is that... Do you not think that in 1936, and you're old enough to remember it, and so am I, right. that it would have been a fine move indeed 
if the West in those early days had boycotted Hitler's Olympics. It would have been a splendid thing. Wouldn't it? Right. And it might well have triggered a little something which might have lifted up the backbone of the people and prevented the Second World War. You're absolutely right. Does not the same apply today? Not in the slightest. It's not the policy of the Soviet Union, one of continued prod retreat, prod retreat, prod retreat. Total nonsense. On its absolute world plan for domination. Total nonsense. You and I are the same age, I inquired. No, we're not. You're 62. much younger than I am. 62. Is that your own hair? That's my own You've hair. You've got more you hair than I have. Okay, okay. fine. And <laughs> uh, then you will remember that in 1946, there were Soviet troops in northern Norway to which they chased the Germans who had tried to take more months. They were withdrawn of their own volition. There were Soviet troops in Finland. The Finns and the Germans had surrounded... Three men in a Let me, let not at all. Divisions. Divisions. The 46 in Norway. Divisions. And they got out under circumstances under which no one, nothing but a third world war could have stopped it. Uh, Denmark, Bornholm Island, Soviet troops. Romania, correct. Uh, Romania, which... They didn't have much choice if we get out of Denmark. They had no... What are you talking about? Nothing could have stopped them but a third world war. They got out of Norway, Denmark, Finland, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Iran, where there was a, where there was a world issue. Iran, uh, we had to raise they an issue. They were only in a very small part of Iran at the time, Obama. Oh, uh, they had the northern half. That's right, Britain the British had the southern, and the southern half. And the United I was there States, at the time. Fine, and the United States had the railroads up and, and down. And why did they get out of Bonholm and the rest of these places? Because Eisenhower made the weak deal on, on behalf of Roosevelt. No, on no, no, Berlin. No, 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 not, not at all. The West should have taken Berlin and kept Berlin. Uh, the West could not have taken Berlin. Uh, you see, my chief objection, I started... We're not going to fight the old world war. Okay, there. fine. I, uh, my chief, I started on a high You're note. Are you trying to tell me that they're a fine, generous world power which does not plan domination? Of course they don't plan domination. It's oh a fine and generous that has nothing at all to do with it. Hung Hungary. Uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, fine. I Bulgaria. Next. Hold it, 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 please. I totally opposed. I have my own radio program back home in business for 23 years. I totally opposed the Soviet occupation of Hungary and Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. because I think that it was and is against the desires of the peoples of those countries. Two years after the Czechoslovak invasion of 1968, let me tell you something. Uh, I was teaching at the University of California in 1969. What were you teaching? Uh, sociology uh -huh. of the Soviet Union. That's my specialty. That's I've right. been in that field uh, for 40 years, okay? And uh, I had as a guest a Soviet uh, foreign affairs expert, and I ripped him up and down and crossways about Czechoslovakia, and he mm -hmm. surprised me with his, his response. Mm -hmm. He didn't defend their arguments. He said, wait a couple of years. And I wondered what he was about. I didn't understand this. I waited a couple of years. In 1968, there had been no peace treaty in Europe for 23 years. West Germany had never given up the hope of correcting those borders. Within two years after the Russians showed in Czechoslovakia that there was going to be no rewriting of World War II, Willy Brandt signed a peace treaty with Czechoslovakia, with Poland, with the Soviet Union, and cooperated with Brezhnev in bringing about the Helsinki Conference, which is the peace treaty for Europe, because every country says, no, we will not change that. So while the people of Czechoslovakia and Poland, I'm sorry, the people of Czechoslovakia and Hungary, were undoubtedly opposed to these actions, were undoubtedly sacrificed, I come to the, I'll pick you up on your remark about governments telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I come to the unhappy conclusion that in terms of the interest of world peace, it was a necessary move, even though it was against the interest of those two small peoples. A complicated world we're in. Question. Right. What would the Soviet Union have done? What would Britain have done in the old days as an imperialist, aggressive, capitalist power of not the worst order, but quite a brutal order on occasion? Uh, what would they have done if 50 of their diplomats had been seized by a revolutionary mob in Iran? I'll turn that around. Obviously, that to me as an American is question number one. What and would the Soviet it, Union have done? I'll tell you what they'd have done. No, you cannot tell me what they would have done because it would have depended upon the circumstances. If Mr. Carter had not found in the case of Iran that West Germany and Japan said, Jimmy, you can't go in there because we won't have any oil and our industries will stop dead. If Mr. Carter did not have the American people still remembering Vietnam, sitting here... I didn't in the ask you what the Americans should have done. I asked you what the Soviets I'm would have done. Uh, let me give you a, exactly what did happen, okay? Cuba, 1962. 
uh, Khrushchev put his nuclear weapons in there to protect Castro from his point of view. He was put out of office within two years in the USSR, and anybody who knows that situation knows that a very important reason for it was that the ordinary Soviet person made it known, we think Castro is a fine man, we think the revolution is great, but don't endanger us with the possibility of a third world war. And Khrushchev was ousted. This is uh, my answer to your question. You've missed a vital ingredient. Right. Kennedy threatened nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's why he pulled out of Cuba. No. What happened was... Oh, the Soviet people in the democratic fashion said, we don't like this pull out of Cuba? No. First time I've ever had that no, no, piece of no, nonsense no, 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 in my no, life. No, 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 Kennedy threatened nuclear war. Sure. And there was a face down. Monroe Doctrine. And there was a face down, and there was an agreement of which... Uh, my citizens of my country are not reminded, and frankly, it makes me kind of unhappy to find Canadians uh, accepting the nonsense that comes out of Washington. The deal was the, the deal was the deal was that the Soviets would pull out of Cuba if we would promise not to overthrow Castro, and both sides have kept that promise ever since 1962, and that's on paper. That's a good deal. It's a wonderful deal. But it's Castro. It protects Castro. Stop nuclear war. I think it did. Got the missiles away as far as we know from the shores I think of the it United did. States. Exactly. But what would the Soviet Union have done in Iran? I'll tell you what they'd have done. They'd have said, have them out in five minutes or we'll do you. I'll tell you what they did in... And they would have done them. I'll tell you what they you did. You know that perfectly well. I, I, I'll tell you exactly what I... And what Carter should have done. Just a second. What they would do would depend upon the particular circumstances and the dangers involved. For example... Uh, Somalia, which has no strength at all, three years ago told the Russians to get out. Now, obviously, there was no force Somalia possessed to get the Russians out. The Soviet Union decided that in terms of its overall considerations, the best thing to do was to get out. Couldn't supply it. 120 oh, no, 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 shade. no problem at all. Miserable hole. Contrary. Been there too. Contrary. The the uh, United States now wants the very base. Of Somalia. Soviets. Who cares about Somalia? Oh, Somalia. Tiny little place. No, Somalia. What, what was the point of fighting a war in Somalia? So, Somalia. They've done very well in that. They've okay. done very well in Addis Ababa. Yes. They've put their claws into there, haven't they? Right. They've exactly. got claws in Angola. No, it's the Chinese who are in Angola, isn't it? Which oh. which set of commies are in Angola? <laughs> In it, uh, Angola is friendly to the Soviet Union. You still won't answer my question, but we'll try you after the break. Okay. <laughs> mm. William Mandel from San Francisco, Berkeley University. Uh, previously, not at the moment. And do your own radio shtick. Right. In San Francisco. Right. And you or I, I'm not quite sure which, may have been the very first people to do an open line show. I was the first in the United States. Well, I was the best in Canada. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your book, Soviet Women. Right. I presume they're all totally emancipated. Love. Uh, Except at home. Except at home. Oh, Soviet men are male chauvinist pigs. Uh, they are sufficiently male chauvinist pigs so that the woman has to do two jobs. She can be an engineer. She can head a medical school. She can be a member of government, uh, but at home... She's it's... still the old lady. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I was put into Garo the other day that things had vastly improved in the last 50 years, and he wasn't prepared to concede that. Yeah. He talks now about food shortages in the Soviet Union. He talks about great... Uh, some the underground movement says that there is a great current of discontent. Would you agree? Uh, with the first and not the second, they certainly have not solved the meat problem, and I don't know the answer. The, uh, as far as discontent is concerned, I don't agree. I've been there nine times. I speak the language fluently. I cut my hair to Russian style when I go there. I rent Soviet cars and pick up hitchhikers. And the car is a Soviet car, so obviously it isn't somebody prepared for me as they flag me, you see. They call this voting, by the way. They don't use this gesture, they use this one. So the Russian slang is Galasovite, not hitchhike, but to vote. And I would say that the, and I know people clear across the board. I know a writer who has Solzhenitsyn's picture on top of his, uh, on top of his typewriter. I know people clear across the board to hardline Stalinists. I'd say that the, that the percentage of discontent is extremely low for the simplest of all reasons. Lack of communication. No, not No at freedom. All. Not at No all. competing political take, parties. Take the issue, take the issue we were just discussing. The average, if the average American Okay, my son in the studio is in this country because uh, he didn't want to go kill Vietnamese, and I'm all for it, and I'm grateful to your country for letting him come here. 
The, so the ordinary Soviet person says, well, we haven't had to fight abroad for 35 years. Our government must be doing something right. It's as simple as all that. In 1959, my first post-war visit, I went there before the war. 1959, I'd look at my shoes and say, where'd you get them? Nowadays, nobody asks me where I got my shoes. We've got the material things. Oh, uh, they've got the material things. They've got a level of education that... Uh, Would the Soviet Union have stood by while they had 50 of the diplomatic staff held hostage by the Mad Mullah's revolutionary boys? Yes or no? No, the, they wouldn't. The answer is they wouldn't have had it happen. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. Look, A Soviet look, diplomat it, was quoted it. as saying on the day, of the, the day after, yes. if that had happened... At 2 o'clock, by 3 o'clock, they'd have known our attitude. Release I'd, them I'd like else. to see. I'd like to see the, the source of that story. I would put it somewhere differently. Uh, the people yeah, were held. The people were held because we put the Shah in power in 1953, because we trained that murderous bunch of Savak, and while what the Iranians are doing is totally contrary to international law, I don't know what else they could have done. You're trying to tell me that the Soviet Union doesn't train murderous torturers in satellites, and I don't believe it. I believe they're guilty or even more guilty of venality, torture, double-dealing, assassination than the CIA was. I think the CIA is okay. amateurs compared to the Russians. Okay, I don't think that at all. I think that was true until uh, the uh, Hungarian uh, invasion, for example. Well, look the, at the facts. Hold it, hold look it. at the facts in the Afghanistan thing. Yes. Puppet government. It was not a puppet government. I mean, was a puppet government. Not according to the Washington Post expert on this subject. Anyway, puppet or not government, right. I mean, shoots a Soviet uh, envoy, right. kills them, right? Uh, so they say. I don't know. I really don't know. So then the government, then the successive premier, invokes right. the treaty of friendship. No, 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 no. In Amin, Amin invited them. This is the most important uh, aspect of the Another gun at his here's, head. Here's, no, sir. Uh, and according to Harding Carter of our government, Vancouver, Sunday, December 27th, the Soviet troops and equipment poured into the country to aid in an Amin government offensive against anti-communist rebels. Our government has very quickly forgotten what Harding, Harding Carter said on that date, that Amin invited them. Under the terms of the treaty. Okay, let's just wonder. They had a friendship treaty. Of course, so you've got us up there, you've got us up there on the dew line. So oh, I'm sorry, that's correct. You've got us up there in the north. Now, that is your right under international law. We don't have much option. Uh, are you trying to tell me that we're not a defense satellite of the United you States? You certainly are. Of course we're a defense. Uh, sure. Even now we're buying your outdated planes for billions oh, of I dollars. I agree with you 100%. Well, these are the practicalities of international just, life. Just one second. The just Soviet just Union moved into Afghanistan because it's headed for the Indian Ocean. That's not utter nonsense, okay? The British stopped I'm them I'm sorry, I'm going ago. to put that you have an audience that probably listens to you every day. I hope it does. Believes every word I say. Uh, <laughs> okay, let them wait a year or two two or three, I have a reputation of 35 years to protect as a specialist in Soviet affairs. And I'm going to state flatly, and they can communicate with me through you, okay. that they are not moving a step beyond uh, Afghanistan. That's on the record. You have my address. You can communicate with me. And, and if I'm, they do in the start of World War, I certainly will not hesitate to call you. Uh, if, oh. they, if they do and they do not start a world war, no, let me, let me go into why they were there, all right? And why they will not move. It's a sphere of when, the original, when the original John Foster Dulles, the man who... Wonderful man. Uh, <laughs> uh, when John Foster Dulles... We'll go to the brink. ...organized the uh, treaties on the frontiers of the Soviet Union. He knew that Afghanistan was a place they would not tolerate. So he organized, as a Cento Treaty, uh, Turkey uh, and uh, Iran and uh, Pakistan and did not dare to seek to involve Afghanistan for very good reason. Back in 1919, Afghanistan's foreign policy was run by Britain. Right. And until, uh, this was under the czars, uh, uh, Lenin came along and said to Afghanistan, we will recognize your right to run your own foreign policy. Britain was compelled, as a matter of good diplomacy, to follow in a few months' time. The consequence is, this, this will amaze you, the consequence is that, and I can't think of any other example, that Soviet-Afghan relations have been approximately of the nature of U.S.-Canadian relations. I can't think of any other country in the Soviet frontier in which that's true. For all these years, because the Soviets allowed landlocked Afghanistan, you are not landlocked, of course, this is not quite the same, uh, to have transit traffic through the USSR without tax, 
and the, they had good relations with every government, uh, the, uh, the king, Amanullah, for about 30 years. But the idiots we now have in the White House, Mr. Krasinski being the, being the person responsible, try to accomplish today what John Forster Dulles didn't try to do when the USSR was much weaker. In what 15 sense seconds, it tell me. Right. Can Reagan be president? I don't think so. Depending upon the depending upon the opposition, my guess. Would he be any worse from your view than Carter? He's stupid enough to be very dangerous. Carter has made loud noises, but has not made a war out. Carter's of weak. Reagan's stupid enough to start a war. Right. My thanks okay. to Bill Mandel, author of Soviet Women, Soviet Woman, Soviet Women. Not a bad book. I haven't read it. And I don't believe in what he says about Soviet foreign policy. I think it's a plan. So the hell with you. I'll be back after the break. Come on. Are you for or against the tunnel? I'm for it in a way. Answer the question. Are what? you for or against the for tunnel? For everybody else but me, because I'm claustrophobic, so it no, doesn't do me any good. <laughs> no. 18 miles in the tunnel. Mm. It frightens I, me. I don't yeah. like go through the D's tunnel behind the tanker. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a volcano expert from Geology Canada. He may blow his lid. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and we may use the evangelist tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow or Thursday, uh, Mr. Taylor. We'll be back anyway tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. precisely.